Praise God. Praise God. Let's say it together. Amen. Brother, use a pan. Pastor, use a pan. It's just giving us to see. It's time to start. Amen. Are you happy to be here this evening? Amen. Amen. Let's express that glee and joyfulness to the Lord right now. Praise God. Thank you, mighty Savior. God, we thank you, Lord, in this house. In Jesus' name, we sing our praise and our worship.
Lisa Jackson coming being with us this year. She's right over here. Thank you, Thank you Lisa, for coming. Okay, yes. Uh, Wes uh, Arrington and Michael Lamb came to be with us and bring the tent groups. Amen. Amen. Rescue Squad just, just brought him in. He's been very sick for some time with surgery and rehab. And this was a special evening, so they made arrangements for him to be here. We're, we're happy about that. Praise God, praise God. You might be seated for just a little bit. Um, we have a lot of guests here this evening. All of our licensed ministers and ministers maybe that aren't. We're glad that you are here. Praise God. But we have um, our district superintendent, Pastor Wayne Huntley. We want him to come and greet us. I pray for him. I'm very thrilled to be here tonight with all of you and of course to have opportunity to officially welcome Brother Yusupan and his wife to the great state of North Carolina. And most clearly to Eastern North Carolina. And we're thrilled that they're here. We're very excited that he along with the voting constituency of this church felt that it was the will of God that he be pastor here. And we're believing God for some very good things. I've heard a lot of wonderful, supportive compliments, attributes of Brother Yusupan. And we're just thrilled that a stable, consistent, senior, you know, an old man by any means, but a, a senior minister of the gospel is here to lead this church. So on behalf of myself, Pastor Ballestero, all your United Pentecostal Church Fellowship brethren and family, we welcome you and your wife to the great state of North Carolina. We want you to know it, and we're here to help you any way that we can. We support you. We stand with you. Anything that we can do to help you adjust and to be at home here and to uh, be blessed of the Lord. And we thank you for coming to district conference when you just got here. That spoke volumes to me, and I appreciate you being there. And we're praying God's anointing and revival would be upon this local assembly. I also want to give a special greeting to Brother Smith. Brother Smith and I have been friends for many, many, many years. Back when both of us were young evangelists. We first met when both of us were young evangelists in the state of Texas. Brother Smith is a great man of God, yes, high integrity, apostolic ministry, well received throughout the fellowship of the United Pentecostal Church. And I was thrilled when I was made aware that Brother Smith was going to be here. It's a privilege to be in church with you tonight, my brother. We respect you, appreciate you, and welcome to the great state of North Carolina. Amen. Amen. We have been able to be here the last two nights here revival, but we've been here on Facebook Live. This man is a preacher. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Amen. Hey, man, we've enjoyed this ministry and services you've had already. Brother Potts, you're very special to Brother Yusupan. Um, we sat down with Brother Potts uh, soon after this, well, this was uh, taking place. And he told me all the things I should know about you and all the things I shouldn't know about you. <laughs> Brother Potts, just kidding. It was all good. And you guys know each other for a long, long time. Would you say something? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. To Bishop Huntley. Amen. I never met Brother Smith. To you, sir. Amen. Glad to be in your presence also. And to uh, Brother Patterson. Amen. Well, Brother Yusupan gave me instructions just to say a few words and not to preach. That's how long he been knowing me. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Him and I go back a long way when I served in the military 22 years ago in, uh, when I got stationed in Savannah, Georgia under Brother David Hodge, whom Bishop Huntley knows. Oh, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> that's when we started our relationship. Right. Amen. When I came with the first sister pop before God, called her home. 
You know, one thing I can say about your pastor, amen, that uh, he's a man of great integrity. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, yes, he is. And he loves people. Don't care who you are, where you come from. Don't mind your gene or your uh, genealogy or whatever you want to say, or your nationality. He's about people. He was single at the time when we met him. And uh, God miraculously sent a mantle down to uh, the swoop in the mantle of Cindy Yusufan. <laughs> and she kind of just picked him on up and took him on away. But the one thing I loved about him, wherever I went, I was stationed in Germany. He would call me in Europe. When I was stationed in Korea, he would always call me at least once a month at every quarter, every chance he got to make sure I was doing well. Great. Well, that career moment, I'm glad he called because that was my worst trial. Because we couldn't take, I couldn't take my wife and children with me to Korea. But those phone calls from him made a big difference. Not only is he a man of God, but he's a friend. Oh, a friend indeed. A friend that loves us at all times. Amen. I can speak about that because I do know him. Amen. And y'all are getting a great man of God, one that's going to love you. There's one thing I like about him, and if y'all would love this, he will tell you the truth. And it's how you accept it and what you do with it. Amen. And you want somebody like that to be a great man of God in your presence that will tell you. Amen. So stay open. Get behind him and sister use a pad. They're going to love you. And they're going to take care of you. You take care of them. Amen. Amen. Love you, brother use a pad. Great to have you. I'm going to say it called Brother Huntley usually say it, but I'm going to say it this way. Welcome to being the Tar Heel State of North Carolina. Amen. Amen. So, Pastor Randy Watts from Statesboro, Georgia, I spoke to him before services, and he uh, could not be here, but um, he's the one to help us make connections. Uh, in fact, Brother Yusupan used to pastor his church there in Statesboro, Georgia for many years, and uh, so they were very close friends, and uh, so I won't go into that story because it might take me to, but it was, it was great when God was working in uh, great ways, and we appreciate it. Also, Brother and Sister Canarium, they came and ministered to us uh, three or four times, I guess. Would you say something? Just a moment. He preached his heart out. He loved you. I believe he would have took you on, but it just wasn't God's plan. Doors closed. <laughs> and we just learned that Wednesday, another door opened. And where? Farmville, Virginia. He has been elected pastor there. Amen. So God works it all out, doesn't he? So good to be with you tonight. And I give honor to all the ministry here. And you've been in our prayer ever since we we was here. And then this whole church has been in our prayer because we believe that there is something here. And I, I want to thank all of you because, because this, believe it or not, this was the starting ground for where we're at right now. And it was God's will to, to use you to help us project us into something greater. We don't always see God's will. And we don't always know. What, you know. Sometimes we're just feeling like Abraham walking out there in the, in the wilderness trying to figure out where we're supposed to be. But if you follow long enough, God will guide you and direct you into all things. And I thank this church for everything that you have meant to us. You have been inspiration to us. Hold on, because great things are going to happen. I believe it. Amen. Let's give the Lord some praise right now. Amen. Thank God. Praise God. Praise God. My, my, we're getting ready to be ministered to. Pastor, you're going to help, right? Well, I'm misunderstood. Let me read your text. <laughs> I thought this would be a treat. <laughs> Amen. God bless you all. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. We are so glad to have everyone here with us tonight. As it, it is our honor and our privilege. You know, God is wonderful. He's omnipotent. He's mighty. Everything, every word that's ever been written cannot describe just how wonderful God is. And I am so thankful 
that I know who he is.
church and we appreciate him also Cruz was always there in Spanish ministry to back him up and we appreciate him as well amen we have another licensed minister brother Tucker we're glad to see him this evening amen let's give these guys a good hand amen. 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 he's nothing but a pain in the neck <laughs> This young man is anointed to sing and play. Like I've never seen before. We've never had a bad service. Who would expect to have a bad service? It was always a joy to be here in every service. I think I missed one because I had obligated myself to preach somewhere the year before for Brother Blake, I believe it was. And, um, and so it, it, we just appreciate the unity of the church then and the unity of the church now. Praise God. And now you can move forward in Jesus' name. Do all that it's in your heart to do for the Lord in this great community that needs you because they need the gospel. Praise God. Let's stand together and as you prepare. Help us. Thank you. I almost forgot who, who received the offering. It's been, it's been two whole months since I've not been here. <laughs> amen, amen. Brother Cabrera, pray if you will. Thank you, Lord, for your service, Lord. We are, we are fairly anointed tonight, oh God. God, guide us tonight. Give us your spirit, Lord. I know you have told us tonight, Lord. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, we give you this offering, Lord. In the name of Jesus, bless you tonight.
everybody say praise the Lord. Glory a Dios. Amen. You may be seated in the name of Jesus. It is a great honor of mine to welcome all of our guests, as it has already been said by Brother Patterson. Thank you for being here. To our district superintendent, Brother Huntley, thank you very much. I want you to know that I have always admired Brother Huntley from a distance. I've never had the opportunity to meet him. The first time my path crossed his path, which wasn't in person, he was on a film strip for Christmas for Christ. That's been a few years ago. Amen, amen, amen. But I've heard his preaching throughout the years, and I count it an honor. And thank you for making me welcome at the North Carolina District Conference. They were so kind. Amen, and I appreciate that. And my friend, Greg Potts. What can I say about Brother Potts? I won't tell you. <laughs> but I am honored that he has come to be here tonight to be with us in Jesus' name. Before I turn this service over uh, to our guest speaker, Brother Smith, there's one more thing that I want to do. For the past nine or ten months, Brother and Sister Patterson have been coming from Aberdeen over here to preach and to minister, and he has done an excellent job. Amen. And when I stepped in, amen, my job is a whole lot easier. I, amen, let's stand on our feet, let's give him a hand. But that is not all. I want you and Sister Patterson to come. And I want you to stand right down here. We have a, I'll come out in front of you so I can, you can look at everybody and smile. We have a token of appreciation. And I asked this church to do it and they have responded very well. I want to present to you a check for $1,000. I don't know who to give it to you. You, you, you. Who's the boss? Anyway. But I want to I thank you from the bottom of my heart. So thank you for your sacrifice. And the Lord bless you. Everybody say, God bless Brother and Sister Patterson. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Now, Brother Patterson, I know you preached a lot of time about tithing when you were here. So, the tithe, um, I expect it in the mail. I know you all. I expect it in the mail. No, you pay your tithe at home. <laughs> Amen. God is good. Let's everybody stand. It is an honor and a privilege one more time to bring Reverend T.L. Smith from Kinder, Louisiana, by Granite City, Illinois. Amen. To this pulpit to minister. As I mentioned the first night that he was with us Wednesday night, I first became introduced to him over the telephone. I heard of him. Some people testified about him, and I said, I need to call this man because my wife and I were going through a rough time. And he took time out, not knowing me, not knowing if I was a crackpot, and he might think I am. But he called me, and he spent probably about 45 minutes on the phone with me and my wife. And since that time, it has developed into a friendship. I had him numerous times, preached for us in Texas. And any time I was going through Louisiana on our way home to Georgia, I would call him to see if he was home and eat dinner. Because he told me, I'll never forget what he told me. He said, you know, all these people say they're my friends, and they, they go through kinder, and they never call me. Well, every time I go through to kinder, I call him to see if he's there, and if he is, we'll go out to eat. Amen. But he and Sister Smith are precious people. And I, I'm not going to take any more time. I know this is an installation service, and he has a special thing that he is going to do, but I also told him to take his liberty in the spirit. Amen. To yield himself. To the power and presence of God. That's his word right here. Yeah. In Jesus' name. Brother Smith, come. Take your liberty. Everybody say, God bless Brother Smith. I will praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. 
God bless you. You may be seated for just a moment. Uh, it is indeed such a pleasure. Uh, I would be remiss tonight if I did not thank this local assembly for your presence and your support during the last two nights of service. God bless you. And of course to my good friends, brother and sister Yusufan, it's such a pleasure to be here and serve with them. Uh, just met briefly, Brother Patterson, good to see you, your wife, God bless you. So glad that you're here. I heard the name Brother Canarian, is that right? I, I remember Brother Canarian from Pennsylvania. That's your uncle? And back in probably 1970, 71, when I was preaching there, I met him in some of the fellowship. They were a sister organization to the UPCI. I believe it was Church of Jesus Christ Apostolic, if I remember correctly. And uh, I wondered, because that is not, uh, uh, as usual, a name is Smith. <laughs> Amen. And it's good to be in God's house. And Brother Huntley, uh, I remember when we were just young evangelists trying to get good enough to get a church. Because that's what they said back yeah. then. You evangelized only until you got good enough to get a church. And I, I, I remember uh, at Texas Count meeting uh, one year, you had that old green marquee. That's right. And uh, we were there. And, you know, camp meetings, conferences, holidays, whenever good times for evangelists. Because there's a little saying, no preaching, no pay. Right. <laughs> and Brother Jerry Green from uh -huh. Fort Texas. Oh, yeah. And you'd go during the middle of the camp meeting, preacher, and come back and, and lay the significant, back then, uh, oh, yeah. a very significant amount of money. And we were just kind of talking about wouldn't it be nice if we could preach in places that would pay that all, all that time. But uh, he and Sister Huntley have been wonderful people, and I am, uh, I am so uh, thrilled to have him in this service. Uh, you know, it's a little bit intimidating to preach before Brother Wayne Huntley. <laughs> yes, it is. And uh, known throughout the ranks of Pentecost, uh, not only in this nation, but uh, across this world. Now, I realize it looks like it's about 8.23, maybe 8.23 and a half here. And uh, I realize that uh, my goal tonight is to get through just before you do. <laughs> because if I don't, we're both going to be miserable. <laughs> yes, we are. And uh, I was I was conversing with Brother Tenney via text uh, uh, just a couple of days ago, and uh, uh, you know he is quite the word master. He's got something to say for for every occasion. He said that give it to them good, just don't founder them. Don't try to give it all to them at one time. So I'm going to do my best. Pastor has asked me to just kind of preach a little bit before uh, we do the actual installation service. So I hope that's all right. And I will do my best not to weary you nor keep you beyond what you want to be kept. I'm going to read just a very short passage of Scripture from the book of Mark, chapter 11, and verse 22. Mark, chapter 11, and verse 22. And uh, again, thank you for coming to this service. Such a momentous occasion, the installation of a, of a new pastor. Again, this is red ink for the people that think red ink is more important than black ink. And there are those that do. I don't know why, because it's all God's Word. That's right. But some people seem to think that red ink means something a little bit extra special. Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Would you lift your hands and your hearts? Let's ask God to help us tonight. I live for you, I live for you, I live for you, I for you, I live 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 for you, I live
I talked to you about the sock principle. The sock principle is something the Lord spoke to me probably 15, 16 years ago and uh, told me I needed to introduce that to every church. I know it's been preached on separately, but this is a principle, the SOC principle, S-O-C. Submission, obedience, and commitment. Right. And without this principle in your life, you cannot be saved. Right, 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 right. And you know, I don't know when we thought we became so educated or knowledgeable about God's word that it could become common to us. All right, come on. But unfortunately, we are living in an age where it's just words. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. We have forgotten the intensity and the truth of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you the word of God is irrefutable. Right. The right. word of God is immutable. Right. Right. The word of God is eternal. Right. And the word of God is supernal. And when the world's on fire and darkness fails the sun, this word is still going to be available. And we have a Genesis and we have a Revelation, but actually, he said in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word, verse 12, 14, somewhere around there, says, made flesh dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Now, Jesus, who is the express image of the Word, right. are Jesus, who is God made flesh. saying to us very simply here tonight we complicate things he is simply saying have faith in God right, right. Now, let, let me just talk here just a little bit you get sick so you go to your doctor and he looks at you and he examines you and he'll prescribe, prescribe maybe a Z-pack or some right. form of medication. And he'll say, now, you go home and right. for seven days, you take this three times a day. Pretty tight. Three times a day, you take it. You take it. Do you know what we'll do? Religiously, we will set our clocks, our phones, whatever it is that we have, and we will obey that to the nth degree. Right. And... So, because you know you have three choices. Do you know that? You've got three choices. We can trust God and be healed. We can go to the doctor and get treated. Or we can suffer. But for those of you that choose door number three, would you please suffer in silence? Because we don't want to hear it because there's other choices. So, at the end of seven days, we're not well. So we don't criticize the doctor. We don't bad mouth it. We don't talk about he's not much of a doctor. You know what we do? We go back to him. And you say, well, it's a little bit worse than what I thought, so I'm going to give you another round, and we'll go through, and this time that gets a five day twice a day. And at the end of five days, we're still not well. But we still don't gripe at the doctor. We still don't talk about, well, he don't know what he's doing. We, you know, we just go back to it. Come on. And you say, well, you know, I didn't really want to do this, but I'm going to give you the, I'm going to give you the big bomb now. And you're going to take one of these, one today and one tomorrow. And... Well, if the one today and the one tomorrow would take care of it, why do you give it to me to begin with? <laughs> And so now then we've gone about two and a half weeks. <laughs> and after that second day, we're well. You say, man, I've got a good doctor. If you're ever sick, you need to call me. Well, I've got news for you. In that two, two and a half weeks, you've either got well or died anyway on your own. <laughs> but we come into the presence of God. With our needs. And we come for prayer. And a man of God or woman of God lays hands on us in Jesus' name. We don't get what we want. So we said, I knew it wasn't real. Well, that preacher must not have been in tune with God. No, my friend, Jesus said, you've got to have faith in God. Now, there are three things we need to understand about this. Number one, You've got to know who God is. Right. Does anybody here know who He is? Yeah. Can anybody here tell me His name? Yeah. Do you really know Him? Yeah. We used to sing that old 
that song. Do you know my Jesus? Do you know my friend? Have you heard that he loves you? Have you heard that he cares about you? My God is not some abstract gray beard sitting on a throne of judgment with arrows of destruction waiting to destroy me when I do wrong. He is my loving father. How much more shall my heavenly father give me good gifts? So it's time for us to make some revelation knowledge. Who is your God? Can I tell you a little bit about my God? My God, three times I have flatlined. Three times I have been pronounced dead. Not by emotional Pentecost. Don't you hate that term? Pentecost. I hate that. We're not Pentecost. We're Pentecost. Right, 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 right. So I'm not talking about a bunch of emotional Pentecost. But with not three times I have black line. And three times my God brought me back. That's you, my God. That's you, my God. But just a few months ago in Granite City, there is a woman in church. She's married actually to Eric Jolly. And Eric Jolly is the son of old brother Ernest Jolly. Uh -huh. And uh, I was preaching about three, four, maybe five years ago now in, in another place. And Eric come in and he's a woolly booger, been away from God a long time. God filled him with the Holy Ghost, brought him back. Then I, I went up there to pastor and he got to dating this, this woman in the church. And so now they're married. And, and Heather is a nurse. But she's got more degrees than the thermometer's got. She's not just a nurse. She's not even just a charge nurse. She is a director over three floors of one of the largest hospitals in St. Louis, Missouri. She's not a dummy. She's not some emotional penny cost. She's a very educated and medically sound and knowledgeable individual. And very private person. She doesn't tell things. And, and the first thing that happened is uh, she was standing on the platform and she hadn't even told her husband. Nobody knew this. But she was having some heart problems. And her heart would race, and then it would get out of uh, syncopation, and, and she would, it was, it's like she's going down. And, and I didn't know that. Nobody knew that. Not, not her mama, not her daddy, not her husband, not her sister. Nobody knew it because she just wouldn't tell it out. And I was standing in the front, and she was one of the praise singers. And the Lord spoke to me, and I stopped the music, and I said to her, Heather, your heart will never beat out of sync again. God is healing you right now. Now. And you know what happened? She said it felt like they had shocked her heart and it went back into syncopation and it's never to this day gotten out of syncopation. I'm trying to tell you who my God is. I'm trying to tell you who my, I don't know about your God, but I know who my God is. He's the God that sweeps in like a mighty rushing wind. He's the God. Maybe eight weeks, I can't remember. She come back to me this time. And she's, she was being considered for a promotion. And uh, in order to do that, because of insurance, key man insurance, they were going to have to do a complete fisc, and they did. And when they did, they found a tumor inside her heart. Now, we're talking about emotional Pentecostal, okay? They found a tumor about the size of a, uh, I don't know, a little larger than a golf ball, inside her heart. When they consulted, they said, because of what it is, where it is, we don't think surgery is an option, and we're not sure that any kind of radiation or chemo is an option. So they said, we're going to think about this, and we're going to study this, and we'll get back with you in a few days. Well, she didn't, she didn't let her 
excuse my French letting her dress tail uh, sit in that chair very long that she was in the house of God she said pastor I got a problem I shouldn't have said that I shouldn't have said that <laughs> and she told me and so I said to her well Heather that's not a problem see that's easy for me to say because I'm not the one that got the diagnosis right easy for me to say. Yeah. Well, it was easy for me to say because I know who my God right, is. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. You're in pretty good shape. <laughs> Got back trouble. Come on. Neck trouble. Okay, good. Then I'll use you. Here's what we want and expect. And if we don't see it, we don't believe it's God. All right. When we want... We have a need. We want prayer. We want that preacher to approach us right, right. with that body language. We want to get into that preacher's crowd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to get. We want him to get that clawed hand. Yeah. We want him to shake that hand and slap it on our forehead, and we want him to give us half of it. And if he doesn't do it. We say, he don't have any faith. He's not, he's, he, he don't care about me. And just sitting there in my office with her husband, I just got up out of my chair, walked and said, Heather, in Jesus' name be healed. Tumor, be dissolved. Right, 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 right. Well, he said, have faith in God. Now, the original says, have faith of God. Uh -huh. mm, okay. Well, that's what he said. Did he not say that? He said it. So then, why don't we have it? We have not because we ask not. And sometimes when we ask, we're asking amiss for the wrong reason. God judges us not only for what we do or do not do, but he judges us for our motive in what we do or don't do. All right. She went back because they called her in because this is a big deal. They've got all of the tests, the PET scans, everything they've got. And, and, and they're saying, we, we, have, we have consulted with the best. We cannot do surgery. We cannot do radiation. We cannot do chemo. We're not sure what's going to happen. We're just going to have to watch it. We don't know how long it's been there. We don't know what's going to evolve. And she said, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to scan me with whatever that is, a pet scan? I'm not sure I'm not a doctor. I don't know. I don't know if a pet seems to me like a dog or a cat, but whatever that scan is that they can do. That she said to her, they said, Heather, that's that's several thousand dollars. She said, I'll pay for it. My insurance may not pay for it, but I'll they said, No, because we we'll, we'll do it. The hospital was army. And they put her through it. Guess what they found? <laughs> Nothing. Oh, the machine was broke the first time. No, the machine wasn't broke. I'm trying to tell you who my God is. Now, if you want to have faith in something, you have faith in the God that I serve because I know who my God is. Now, I, I, I gotta go on. I'm not really going to go through with that. Let's go. The second thing that I want to ask you tonight is this. What do you want from God right here, right now? You see, we, you just come out of the land of tomorrow, manana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big time. I, I, what did I go once a year and sometimes twice a year? Yes. The entire time he was down there. And when you flew into there, you could feel the difference. Laid back. No, not laid back. Just flat out laid out. <laughs> Why do it today when you've got tomorrow and the next day and next month? And that's a hard spirit to break. And we translated that into our walk with God. You know, why believe God for it when I can suffer? Now, I'm going to tell you a true story. Well, I was going to call his name. Are we on live stream? Okay, then I won't call his name. <laughs> A man was in an accident, destroyed his back because it was an offshore situation, big, 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 big money. And he was at the end of three years in this lawsuit, and they were getting ready for the settlement. 
but he was almost out of his mind with pain. And the strongest medication that they give him did not touch the pain that he's having. So somebody encouraged him to come to one of our services. Right. And he showed up. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I, I'm, just, I'm just an old country boy. I just get up and let her fly. And I just do this is what I do. And when I say, he come up and, and here's what he told me. He said, I want you to pray for me. I don't want to be healed. Because I haven't got my check yet. That's exactly what he told me. He said, I just want God to take the pain. He said it. Now, how do you pray? <laughs> God, if you, if you hit him, he don't get his check. He don't pay tithes. <laughs> I'm glad God sorts all that stuff out. <laughs> But my question is, what do you want right here, right now? Now, I'm going to tell you, I wish I could put into some of my saints what, whatever's in that guy right back there on that stretcher, that girl. Right. I've only been in two other places where somebody hired an ambulance to bring them to church. And that's because the pastor announced a healing service. And they took it seriously, and they, they, they come in ambulances to, to be healed. But he just wanted to be in service night. And, and you know, the Lord's going to touch him. There's a difference in a healing and a miracle. A miracle is instantaneous. A healing is a process. Right, right. I'd rather have a miracle. Right, right, right. But I'll take a healing. Now, when I flatlined, I couldn't wait on the healing. I needed a miracle, and I got it three times. You want to know what's wrong with me? For three times, oxygen has been deprived in my brain, and so that's made me kind of crazy. But I, I like the crazy that I am because I believe, and I'm going to tell you, what I want right here, right now, is what I'm going to get. I can't put it off. I can't wait till tomorrow. I can't wait till next week. I can't wait till it gets a beyond. I just got to believe right now. What I want right here, right now. Right in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm, the Lord willing, if he tarries, I'm going back for my 57th revival in the same church. I buried two pastors and the guy that's there is now younger than me, but I told him I'm going to preach his funeral too. <laughs> and so the other pastor was still alive. This pastor was his assistant at that time. And I've been there and I've been going there for many, many years. So they knew me and, and you know, they, they, you know, never know what I'm going to do or how I'm going to do it. But I preached three nights. And for some reason, those people look like who the hell's on Tombstone. They were dead as last year's bird's nest. There was no life. There was nothing. I couldn't get an amen. I couldn't get a Baptist nod nor a Methodist call. <laughs> I can say that because my great-grandfather was a Baptist preacher. And my great-grandfather on the other side was a Methodist preacher. My maternal grandmother was Campbellite Church of God. My maternal grandfather was hard-shell pilgrim Baptist. But thank God I had a grandmother, my dad's mother, that in 1918 received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and was baptized in Jesus' name. And she put something in me. So I just I just walked the platform went up so there were steps there. So I just went and I just sat down on the steps. I crossed my legs, folded my arms, and did just like this. Now they thought, you know, I was just fixing to do something crazy. So they just kind of waiting, okay, what's it gonna do? They thought I guess that's gonna wake them up. No, you wanna sleep, sleep on. I just sat down. Do you know that 20 and 30 seconds of complete silence in a service? can be a little unnerving. <laughs> and when that stretches out into a minute and two minutes and three minutes, it really gets, and all of a sudden I begin to shift and, and the pastor, he's sitting over there and he's going, 
whisper. What you doing? I said, I just ignored him. I just sat there. I figured if you can sit there, I can sit there. What's the difference? And in the midst of that uncomfortable thing, the youth pastor's son, about 19 years of age, got away from his mom and daddy, run down the aisle. Now, I'm, I'm actually in front of the pulpit, and just sitting there. And, and he just comes, and he stands there. And you know, kids can really get your goat. Did you know that? And sometimes you just want to reach out there. Give him a little love pal. And he's standing there, and he's got that little attitude hand on his hip looking at me. And so I go to look back at him. Thing is, Jonathan was born legally blind. The glasses he had on were weighted down on his nose, and it was just, and I related because that's the way I was. And I, I finally, I finally just looked at him and said, What do you want? Just like that. Because that's how you related to everybody. And he made one of the greatest statements of faith that I've ever heard in all of my life. And I've been preaching since 1960. He said, I have come to see. He did not say, I come to get prayed for. He did not say I come expect it. He said I can't. Oh, what is it? That's what I'm talking about. Having faith in God. What do you want right here and right now? I, I was moved. I laid the microphone down. I called in a week. I didn't even get up. I laid the microphone down. I took his glasses off. He became helpless. And I laid his glasses down where they couldn't get broken. I put one thumb in each of his eye sockets. Uh, and I did not scream and I did not holler. I simply said, Lord Jesus, uh, in your holy name, heal these eyes. Uh, make them whole again. Uh, honor the faith of this young boy. And I want you to know something happened. People as dead as a doornail, nobody moved. I didn't say anything. I just reached over and got a songbook. They still use songbooks. Now we do 7-Eleven singing. Seven words on the screen and we sing them 11 times. But they, and I, I didn't say anything. Still no glasses. I just give him the songbook. And he opened it and began to read the word. Oh, I forgot to tell you, he was legally blind. Right. Right. A little movement. I held up a finger standing like from here to Brother Patterson. And he said, You got one there. Oh, I forgot to tell you, he was legally blind. Oh, come on. I backed off. I did this. And he said, Yeah, you got two fingers up. Yeah, kids. <laughs> I got as far away from him as I, I went to the other side of the church against the wall. And I just did this. And he said, now you're holding up your whole hand. you got five fingers. Right. Now there's a little stirring. Come on. Come on. But still not much going on. Come on. So they give me a little piece of paper about this square. That's got the order of service on it. Number one, I've never paid any attention to an order of service in all of my life. And I'm probably not starting now. Right, right. And that print on it was so small that even with my cheaters, I could not read it. But I just picked it up and I gave it to him, and that boy held that and read every word. Wow. Then, wow. then people began to respond. Well, why don't you respond when the need is there? You've got to determine who your God is, and then when you know who your God is, you've got to decide what do I want right here, right now. I'll do this and then I'm going to quit. Maybe. The third thing I'd like to ask you tonight is simply this. What are you willing to do to receive what you want? Right. Well, Pastor, if you were a man of God, you'd tell me, you'd lay hands on me, and be over. No, we all want an apostolic ministry. We want apostolic pulpits. We want apostolic preachers. Don't we? I'm not sure we do. I'm not sure we do. But you'll never have 
the fruition of an apostolic ministry until you have an apostolic laity. In other words, you want me to go hog wild and pig crazy. Come on, come on. Right. You want me to do everything I can do, but what are you going to do? Right. Right. So what are you willing to do? I tell you what that man back there was willing to do. They was willing to hire an ambulance to bring him. Come on. I'd say that's a pretty good statement of faith, come wouldn't on. you? That's your husband, isn't it? You're a nurse, aren't you? You understand a little bit about what's going on. That's not an easy thing for him to have come here tonight. Is it? No. I, I told the guy over there, I said, boy, you don't get many of these where you have the ambulance and you take them to church, do you? He said, it's a little unusual. <laughs> now, you see, what you'd like for me to do, here's what you'd like for me to do. Don't say, I look sanctified, holy. It means, you know, you'd like me to run over there and put my hand over the table of Jesus, and you'd like to come up and rip that stuff out and jump up off of there. That's not what you want. Come on. All right. Come on. So what are you going to do, preacher? Well, no, I'm turning to David. What are you going to do? All right. All right. All right. These signs shall follow a certain group of preachers. Come on. Come on. Well, just a certain church. Come on. But what does it say? To them that believe. Do you believe? 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 What's your status since Wednesday night? No pain. No pain. No headaches. Able to turn my head. No headaches, able to turn her head. Degenerative disc. The Lord spoke to me of C2 and 3. Did not know her. First time I've ever been here. And she come up and she said, that's exactly it. Because she couldn't turn her head. She had Constance headaches. She, because it's all degenerated. They couldn't do surgery. They couldn't do shots. They couldn't do anything. But now, either she's lying. Uh, or something's happened to her. Uh, she's moving that head. You don't do that with degenerative deals. So my question tonight is, not what am I going to do? What are you going to do? You know, if I had somebody that ripped it, if I had if I had some believers here tonight, I wouldn't have to say anything to that man. That'd be two or three. You walk over there, you lay hands on you, pray for him, and God would begin that process in his life. God would strengthen those legs. God would take care. God would make sure that medication didn't get it all messed up again because of all of the problems that are attended to it. In the name of the Lord Jesus. I 
I feel like kindred spirit of faith from here tonight. God's, God's going to take And says, I don't know you. I've never seen you before in my life. But the Holy Ghost is in this place. And the Holy Ghost is all over you right now. In every situation that you feel is impossible in your life. The mighty God is right here, right now. To do for you whatever it is that you believe in God. By the authority that's in the name of Jesus. And the crown of their head. And the sole of their feet. same time we run down there and we prayed for her and when we did that tumor instantly dissolved in her and they said she had Hodgkin's lymphoma or something like that and it was in her bloodstream and it was it was bad and they said you need to you need to get into a program but God healed her and when we did go home she did go to her position and they did run the test but all of the tests that had been run at the Smith Whitland Clinic that they were there though they weren't mistaken it wasn't anything wrong it's just that I know who Jesus is and I know what my Jesus can do and right here in this place in Rocky Mount, North Carolina God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in me in you in us we have it already loose it Anybody believe? Yes. 
understand that it's by God's word, not by the activity of my body. Now, I get, I get excited. You hear me? I get excited. When the Spirit gets moving on me, I get excited. And if you don't, you're dead. And if you don't, your wood's wet. So put it by the fire, reconsecration, and rededication, and dry it out. I got to quit. This is an installation service. You need to be installed. God's ready to rain out promises upon this church. Yes, he is. I've never been here in nearly 60 years of preaching. This is the very first time that I've ever been in the state of North Carolina. I thought it was, but found out it was South Carolina to preach. I've never heard <laughs> never heard of Rocky Mount North Carolina. Didn't know anything about you. Didn't know anything about the history of this church. I've known Brother and Sister Yusupan for nine, nearly ten years now. Know what they are. Know their walk with God. You've gotten some good, some good people. They will serve you well. They will serve you well. They will serve you well. <clears throat> and I felt... The very first night, this man does not tell me because his way off of it. If a pastor tells me stuff, yeah. either I don't use it or I get up and say, I'm going to tell you this, but the pastor told me. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's I, I, why would I want to cheat you and, right. and represent God as being in it when it wasn't God? Right. I'm not going to do it. And he knows from being in Raymondville, he don't say nothing. And she don't either. And that's not how they get around it. But the Lord spoke to me. That there was a spirit that was stifling this church. It's a trust issue. It's a trust issue because of some events that happen. And it's kind of like we get the mentality happens once, shame on you. Happens twice, shame on me. Got news for you, that spirit's got to go. I don't care how abusive or how unright it was, it no longer matters. It no longer matters. And there's a wave of revival that is coming to this church. I believe it. There's going to be some prodigals that are coming home. There's going to be some prodigals, sons and daughters that are coming home. There's going to be some people that have left this church because they just could not deal with the betrayal and they could not handle it. But some of you remain and you follow through. Now, I am speaking to you by the authority of the name of Jesus. Let it go. Sweep it out the door. Sweep it out the door. It no longer matters. It no longer matters. I watched this man take a church. What was it? 25, 30 when you took it? 28. And I watched it go to a hundred and and could have gone more, but that spirit of a manana. And I went down there and I told him, didn't I? Well, you were there. You did some preaching. I tried to tell him. And no matter what I say, you got to listen. And just because you got two ears don't mean you're listening. You got to receive it. This man and his wife will lead you into revival. And they will grow this church here. The responsibility of a pastor is fivefold. It's the shepherd. That's what God's word calls it. Shepherd has a fivefold responsibility. Number one, he's got to feed you. And we cannot be fed what I think, what I believe, but what thus saith the word of the Lord. The second responsibility of a pastor is to provide water. That's the spirit. 
to lead you into worship and to encourage you to allow the Spirit of God. This God you see, I'm going to say this. I'm probably not supposed to, but I'm going to say it anyway. The charismatics, all they want is spirit. Pick them on high, pass them on by, and sell them a Honda Suzuki too. But they don't want any truth. Now, unfortunately, some of our church, some of our Pentecostal churches, all they want is the Word. Well, I got news for you. The letter of the law or the word will kill you. Right. It's the spirit that you know. So the problem is we got to have a balance. Right. Right. The word and the spirit right. Right. in balance. And I, I appreciate this young man and the worship team and the musicians and, and the spirit that you have in it. You keep that spirit and you'll be all right. You get away from it, you're going to be in trouble. And the third responsibility of a pastor is to protect. Now, I pastored only three churches in my life. I told them often I do not have to worry about going to hell. I've already been there. The first church that I pastored, should I say that? I pastored in Georgia. So I don't have to go to hell. I've already been there. It was bad. But every church that I've ever pastored, I protected. And the church that I pastored and retired from and, and expected to never pastor again, learned to trust me. Because we was in revival. A young man that I was helping, his pastor called and said, would you help him? He said, he's trying to get started. So he was three weeks there, did a great job, preaching 15, 20 minutes. That's okay. No, wish I'd preach a little shorter, don't you? I don't preach by the clock. I preach by the calendar. <laughs> but after three weeks, he went out of his prepared sermons. So he got in the pulpit, and he started, and he said, You don't love God. You don't want revival. You don't know how to pray. And he made three statements before I could. it went through my thick skull. You hear what he said? So I just get up. And I walk to him, and I push him out of the pulpit. His wife nearly fainted. <laughs> I stood that church up. I thank them for supporting him for three weeks. I thank them for their prayers and for their concern for revival. I said, go home. Have an early night. Fellowship, if you want to, go home. Come back tomorrow night because it will be different. And then I took him home to my house and about two and a half hours later he understood it more better <laughs> but do you know what that did my church realized he'll protect us right, right, right. you can break fallow ground you can shear sheep but you cannot skin them if you skin sheep they die Besides that, the only one's responsibility is pastor to deal with some things. So we've got to do food. We've got to do water. We've got to be protected. We've got to offer shelter. When you're in trouble and when you're in need, you've got to have a safe place. When the storms are raging and the winds are howling and the waves are crashing, you've got to, this pastor has got to provide a place of shelter for you. And then lastly, certainly not the least important, he's got to give direction. And direction comes from the altar. Oh, you thought I was going to say it come from. No, direction comes from the altar. Direction comes from the altar. So a fivefold responsibility. And there are seven commitments that you've got to make. And you've got to make. You've got to make a commitment to worship, not to ask people to worship. You've got to make a commitment to reach out into this area. 
You've got to make a commitment to discipleship. You need to disciple the people that are here as well as new people that are coming in. You've got to make a commitment to people both in the church and out of the church. You've got to be a people person. If you're not going to be a people person, you're not going to do anything. Just go home and, and become a painter. Too many saw that P thought it meant preach and it meant pain or plow. I don't know. <laughs> then you've got to make a commitment to grow. Then you've got to make a commitment to be faithful. And then you've got to make a commitment, and this is what none of us like, to sacrifice. Your responsibility, fivefold. Your commitment, sevenfold. The word install. Literally means to place in an office with formality or ceremony. It means to fix in position for use. This installation, celebration, has a Bible foundation going back to the Old Testament. You'll find that Moses removed the priestly robes from Aaron and placed them upon his son. Then the son became the high priest. That's begin the celebration of the passing of not just the cloth, but the torch. Perhaps it would be more appropriate to call the clergy men of fire rather than men of cloth. The problem is, they're not all men of fire. Now, he's not Brother Patterson. He's not Brother Stacy. He's not Joe Blow from Kokomo. He's Pastor Yusuf. He's going to do some different things. You know what sheep say? Well, some of you knew. Then, then why are you saying all that other stuff? Sheep are the only thing that have to be led. They cannot be driven. And they cannot fend for themselves. So give him an opportunity. It was before God that David charged Solomon and transferred the kingdom under God to the jurisdiction of Solomon, admonishing him to remember the flock. You're not Lord over God's heritage. You're a shepherd. You're a servant. The burning and shining light that we call John the Baptist relinquished his life's work to Christ Jesus with a verbal message. He must increase and I must decrease. After the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord in that final earthly apostolic encounter, Jesus admonished the apostle Peter, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. And so then he became the patriot bishop of the New Testament. Tonight I want to repeat Paul's enunciation to Timothy. The time of my departure is at hand. Preach the word. Just carry on. Just carry on. As Paul said to Timothy, the faith that was in your mother and grandmother is now in you. So the responsibility that's been in others is now in you. To lead this flock. So. Tonight. I'd like for you. And sister. Use a pan to come. And stand before this pulpit. And face the congregation. Bring Ezra. If she'll stand. If she's embarrassed. Let her sit. I want you to look, Pastor and Sister Yusuf. I want you to look at them. These are good people. I've known them for nearly 10 years. After 10 years, you do get to know some. I've seen them when it was going good, and I've seen them when it was going bad. I've watched their reactions when it was good, and I watched their reactions when it was bad. I saw their faithfulness when it was good. And I saw their faithfulness when it was bad. And never did I see them abuse the church. Never did I see them 
Because had I done so, I'd have come in there and told him. And he knows that because he's given me that privilege and that responsibility. So now then, I charge you to feed the flock over which the Holy Ghost has now made you overseer. I charge you to proclaim without fear the full apostolic message. I charge you to continue in the Pentecostal traditions that have been the hallmark of this, the mother church of the apostolic message. I charge you to preach and declare the whole counsel of God and to leave with love, to preach with fire, and live sacrificially in the light of Calvary. Brother Yusupan, if you're willing to assume these responsibilities, I want you to repeat after me. Before God, Before God in His love and fear, Loving fear. I fully accept, I fully accept the, responsibilities the responsibilities that have been invested in me. That have been invested in me. Sister Yusupan, who is the help me of this man, would you please repeat after me? In the fear of God, in the fear of God I accept the responsibility, accept the responsibility of standing by my husband. In prayer, compassion, and lifestyle to further the gospel through this assembly. Now to the congregation, you have heard this charge. And if you will accept these words of commitment, would you, the congregation, members of this life church, repeat after me. We pledge before God. To stand behind our pastor and his family in prayer, in love, in support, and faithful biblical obedience to the word he preaches. So help us God. It is such an honor and a privilege to have the bishop of this district, Superintendent Huntley. And I'd like to ask him, because of his office, I'd like for him to come and maybe officially give the, give the installation and pray over them. Would you do that? With the witness of the Spirit and the selection of this assembly, the confirmation we feel in the will of God, we're very thrilled to install you as pastor of this church in the name of the Lord. Let the congregation rise and let us pray. Father, we pray the mighty anointing of the Holy Ghost upon Brother Yusupan. I pray that you would equip him, empower him with the anointing of the Holy Ghost, that every yoke would be destroyed, that everything that would restrict would be broken, Let liberty come to this assembly and let the blessing of the Lord overtake all weakness and all failure. Let the name of the Lord be published. Let the gospel be preached. Let souls be saved. Let your name be lifted and a mighty increase come through your glory and for your glory. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Amen. While they play and sing is an act of worship unto the Lord and then to this church and even those that are guests here, I'd like to ask you in an orderly manner, timely manner, if you're physically able, I'd like you just to come and walk and congratulate. Pastor, congratulations. Sister Pastor, Congratulations. God bless you. Welcome them. Receive them in Jesus' name. Worship the Lord. Who are you? Moving you out of here. 
last night, I want to remind you between now and Sunday, our church family, I want you to go over to that church property, pull in, get out of your vehicle, stand on that piece of property and rebuke that mountain, amen, let's remove the trust issue, let's remove the fear issue, and every other issue that may stand in its way, because God's going to do some great things, amen, amen. Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, be here, come early for prayer, and then one week from Sunday, not this Sunday, but one week from Sunday, we will be starting Sunday night service back at 6 p.m., amen, so we will be back at full schedule, amen, but Sunday at 10 a.m. and next Wednesday at 7.30. Thank you for being here, our guests, God bless you. Shake hands, be friendly, love one another to the MS crew. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for bringing Brother Rogues.
Amen. I appreciate your sacrifice. And you gentlemen, come be with us in church. You're dismissed in the name of God.